All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming here tonight to, uh, to the campus, and also people watching online. You can hope, hopefully hear me through that microphone, so that's a bit tricky, but I think they can. Okay. Um, it's nice to see all of you here. It's the first alumni lecture of this new academic year, also in the first week of this new academic year, so it's like a, like a perfect timing. And uh, I'm very happy that we have Catherine Mulry, uh, assistant professor in astrophysics here at Harvard University at the Faculty of Science. And she will tell us all about her research on, uh, I think the words used were astroparticle detection experiments. Um, and I think by then it's already a bit above my head, so I hope that she will explain it a bit, a bit further and a bit more detail. I'm sure she will. Um, so it should be very nice. Um, we have, I think, about 40 minutes of lecture, something like that. And after that, there's time for your questions, of course. Um, for people watching online, you can also ask questions, but you should do that then, unfortunately, by sending a mail to the alumni email address, uh, because apparently the chat function doesn't really work in this program right now. Uh, but feel free to send an email to like alumni at fnde.ru.nl. You've, you've got mails from it before, and then, uh, then I can still read the questions. So do the questions near the end. Unless you get confused about something, that you can, of course, just uh, catch your attention, I think. Yeah, no problem. Um, and after the lecture, <coughs> there is still some uh, possibilities for drinks uh, outside here. Uh, at least for us, the people at home will have to get their own drinks. Um, that's all I have to say for now. So, yeah, the floor is yours, Catherine. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I'm Catherine Mulry. Um, you might notice my voice is a little scratchy. I was teaching this morning for a long time, and I think I inhaled too much chalk, so I'm going to try to make it another hour. Um, but yeah, just a little bit about my background and how I got into this, um, this kind of strange topic. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Delaware in the United States, and then I, uh, when I was there, I had an opportunity to get into some of these remote field work projects. And from there, I mean, it's such a cool experience that I just wanted to keep doing more of that. So. Um, I worked there for a while, and then I moved to Brussels um, to start working on European um, particle detection <laughs> experiments. Uh, actually, there's really nice facilities here and in the Netherlands. And um, I've recently gotten back into the, into the um, ends of the earth game again, uh, which I'll talk about in this field, um, in this presentation. So <clears throat> um, we'll start with just asking... Um, the main question, what is out there? This is kind of the fundamental question that drives, well, probably everybody's research who's doing research, but um, in particular, what I'm interested in is what we can learn about um, extreme environments in our universe by what kind of information they provide us. So if you take some kind of object, this um, particular example is an active galactic uh, nucleus, it's just spewing out tons of information. Um, it's spewing out information in the electromagnetic regime, so that would be like photons we can see with our eyes, radio waves, et cetera. It's uh, spewing out gamma rays. Um, if you have two compact objects colliding, you can get gravitational waves. Um, and then what I'm especially interested in in this talk is uh, what I'll cover are the cosmic rays and neutrino particles that can come from these, um, these places. So, um, <clears throat> Cosmic rays and neutrinos are kind of like, I don't know, sometimes you hear these buzzwords, but um, they're actually a bit nuanced and different. So we'll start by just explaining <laughs> what, what a cosmic ray is and what a neutrino is. So um, cosmic rays actually were discovered about a little bit more than 100 years ago. So a few years, there was the 100th uh, birthday of the cosmic ray, well, the known cosmic rays. Um, they were discovered kind of by accident, like a lot of things. Um, in 1911, Victor Hess um, and others uh, noticed that there was a lot of radiation um, that was kind of problematic for their experiments they were trying to run. Um, here you can see an electroscope, which shows that there's, uh, if there's ionization around, um, the little components there separate, and you can see that there's radiation. So they figured, OK, we, should, um, we assume that the radiation is coming from the Earth, because that's where people are, and that's where they're causing noise environments and things like that. Um, so let's move up and we'll try to get rid of the radiation. So what they did was they went on a balloon <clears throat> five kilometers in the air, and rather than removing the radiation, they found that there was a lot more radiation. Um, so that was a huge mystery, and it also indicated that this radiation must be coming from outer space. Um, and then this was basically the discovery of a cosmic ray. Now, the, um, 
the terminology is a little bit misleading because it's not really radiation. They assumed it was radiation. A cosmic ray is actually um, a highly energetic ionized atomic nucleus or other particle traveling through space um, approaching the speed of light. So these are really particles that are coming from outer space. You can have different types, a proton nucleus, an iron nucleus, and they're bombarding the Earth all the time. And they have an extremely large energy range. <clears throat> the way you get a cosmic ray and not just um, a low energy um, atomic nucleus is you have to um, submit it to an extreme uh, magnetic field, extreme conditions. Things like you would have, for example, in a supernova remnant, that's this picture here, they're very strong magnetic fields, and since the cosmic rays um, are charged, they get bounced around in these fields until they, basically, this is why the ping pong picture is here, you bounce them back and forth until they have such a high energy, they're no longer contained in this object, and then they fly off, and then, if we're lucky, we can see one. <clears throat> now, um, since they're charged, they also are deflected in magnetic fields from their way from wherever they come from to the Earth, so you can't see one in point back directly to where it came from, but you can still get a lot of information. Now, there's a particle related to the cosmic ray called the neutrino. Um, this is a fundamental particle. The cosmic ray is composite. This is a fundamental particle. This table might be familiar. It's the um, standard model of physics, the building blocks of everything else. So if you combine a couple of these things, you get the ingredients for a cosmic ray. But a neutrino itself is just a fundamental particle. And it has no charge, and it has almost no mass. Um, which makes it very, very hard to detect. It's almost invisible, actually. Um, so these are <clears throat> particles. The way they're related to cosmic rays is actually they're produced by cosmic ray interactions. So if you have some kind of environment um, that's accelerating your cosmic ray, it has a lot of other things going on, like, like different matter fields and radiation fields. So if your cosmic ray is super high energy and it collides with something in this field, out pop gamma rays, and neutrinos. And this is the connection um, between them. So neutrinos are produced from cosmic rays in the same place, and they come in a straight line to the Earth. <clears throat> There's one more cool um, method you could get to produce a neutrino, and that is from um, an interaction of a cosmic ray on the, microwave, uh, on the cosmic microwave background. So space is not empty, right? It's almost empty, but there's actually this leftover um, radiation from the Big Bang. This is this famous three degree Kelvin temperature of outer space, right? So if your cosmic ray is high enough energy, all of a sudden outer space is not um, transparent anymore. And it will interact with, one of the, with this field and produce a neutrino that way. Um, this right now, I should say, is hypothetical. This is, it should exist, but this is actually one of the key things that we're trying to detect is the neutrinos. <clears throat> um, from this interaction. So this is, this is the goal. These are the neutrinos we're looking for. Um, but this is a very difficult problem. Um, I'm going to show a couple plots of um, the flux of particles as a function of energy. So um, this is just kind of a schematic of the following plots that are coming up. Um, on the y-axis, it shows you the number of particles that we see per some unit um, volume as a function of energy. And I would just note that both scales are log scale, so this is like a really huge range. And this, this will show you why, why this is such an interesting problem. <clears throat> First, we can look at the cosmic ray energy spectrum. We're going here from 10 to the 9 electron volts all the way to 10 to the 21 electron volts. First of all, that's over 10 orders of magnitude um, of energy, so that's huge. And we're going from a regime where you have one particle per square meter per second, so that's like all the time, um, to the middle area where you have one particle per square meter per year. Okay, it's a little bit harder. And to the ankle, the, the features of this thing are called the knee and the ankle because it could look like an, a leg if you squint, I guess. Um, at the ankle, you have one particle per square kilometer per year. Okay, now this is really hard. And then finally, at the very end of this energy range, it's like one particle per square kilometer per, kilometer per century. So the problem here is that you either need a lot of time or a lot of volume in order to detect these things. Now, why is there such a huge energy range? Um, they come from different sources. They're all, um, 
uh, from outside of our, our general vicinity, or like the Earth, but uh, they come from wildly different places. So at the low energies, the sun produces a lot of cosmic rays. Um, and they're so low energy, they often get deflected in the magnetic field of the Earth. So we don't see these um, necessarily on the, like on the ground. At the middle energies, this is where you get things from supernova remnants. Um, so we see a lot of these, and these are pretty well understood, and, um, and uh, you can detect them pretty regularly enough that, that this source class is, is pretty well understood. But then at the highest energies, it's really a mystery. We know they're there. They're detected, although they're very rarely detected. But we just don't have enough statistics now to know exactly where they come from. But we do know that they're there, and that's an important when we connect them to neutrinos. <clears throat> so that was the cosmic ray flux, um, the number of cosmic rays we see. If we look now at the number of neutrinos we see, it's the same kind of plot, right? Energy on the, y, on the x-axis, flux on the y-axis, and a log scale. And here you can see also a bunch of different populations of neutrinos. So at the very low energies, these are the neutrinos um, also remnant from the Big Bang. These are so low energy, actually, they're so far impossible to detect. It's kind of the opposite problem that um, we have in the, in the field that I'm in, where we're trying to detect higher energy ones that are rare. These ones are low energy and too low energy to interact with anything. You have to have some kind of energy um, to give yourself a big enough cross-section to collide. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, again, you have solar neutrinos. So these come from the sun all the time. You can actually see um, normally, like this photo, for example, you can look at the sun um, and your image is made out of photons, like you can see in your eyes, but you can actually make an image out of the sun from neutrinos because they're just coming from this one source and they travel in a straight line. Um, we have supernova neutrinos. This is very interesting because um, this was... This was a Nobel Prize, actually, for um, the detection of supernova neutrinos. Um, the last supernova, there was just the, the neutrino experiments had just become mature enough that they could capture a handful of neutrinos from the last supernova. So actually, there are a lot of experiments now that are gearing up um, in, in hopes uh, of being ready before the next supernova in our galaxy so they can uh, measure those guys. Um, you can also have... Uh, neutrinos from um, power plants, nuclear reactions there. <clears throat> and then you have these neutrinos that are made in conjunction with the cosmic rays at these, um, these sources in the cosmos. And these are very interesting um, and have barely been detected, we'll say. And then at the very end, these are the ones that are expected to be produced from the interaction of cosmic rays and microwave background, cosmic microwave background. These haven't been seen at all, so this is a really big um, this is a really big area that we're interested in the very end of this energy spectrum. So, <clears throat> to summarize, we know that the cosmic rays exist. These cosmic rays should be associated with neutrinos. So, where are they? Um, so that brings us to the question: How can we actually detect these particles? Um, I'm going to focus on the neutrino detection in particular, although, again, they go hand in hand. If you can detect neutrinos, you can often detect cosmic rays. Um, they're very rare, right? You're talking about something that you need a huge volume to detect or a long period of time. Um, and the highest energy version of these things are so rare that you could spend your whole life waiting for one. So rather than trying to detect the actual particle itself, um, you can use byproducts. So right here I have a snowflake. It might be hard to find one particular snowflake in the world, but if this snowflake um, lands on top of a mountain and creates an avalanche, that will be a lot more obvious, right? So um, this is kind of the uh, analogy you can use for how you detect these very rare particles. You don't detect the particle itself. You, you detect the byproducts um, that come from this particle interacting with something. So to give an example of that, um, <clears throat> This is going to be a video, and what you're going to see is um, a simulation of a cosmic ray as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. I think this is a city map of, I think it's Geneva, and it's going to interact with um, a particle in the atmosphere and then create this whole cascade of particles flowing down. So, wait, sorry.
Okay, there comes your cosmic ray. And you can see these little purple lines um, coming off of it, and those are all tracks of different particles, electrons, gamma rays, muons, et cetera. So you can see from this one almost individual, indivisible, <laughs> um, invisible particle, you get all of these byproducts, and then when it finally hits the Earth, and you can see it with a detector, um, you have a lot more information to work with. So suddenly this one particle per square kilometer per year doesn't seem like the end of the world. Um, that was a simulation of a cosmic ray. Uh, this is going to be a simulation of a little neutrino interacting this time in ice. So here's your neutrino. Um, it's going to uh, interact with a molecule in the ice. And then you can see that <clears throat> it emits some kind of light. This is Shrinkoff radiation. But this light that's emitted from this interaction allows it to be detected. In this case, um, we'll talk about it more in a minute, but this is a particular detector called Ice Cube, where little cameras can pick up that light. So all of a sudden, these, these invisible things um, are able to become visible. So um, right, in this example, we were talking about light. This is Shrinkoff light coming from the interaction. A neutrino interacts, and it produces um, its uh, it's related particle, maybe a muon, and then that muon will travel through the ice and emit some kind of light. And there are a lot of experiments um, that have been set up around the world to try to detect this kind of thing. For example, um, this is an experiment called Super Kamiokanda, and um, this was built in an old mine shaft in Japan in a mountain. Um, it's this huge volume uh, filled with photo, um, photo detectors. You can see like little people there. Um, for reference for how big this is, and, oh, and the, the um, Statue of Liberty. And this thing just waits for a neutrino to pass through it and then tries to capture um, the light and information from that neutrino. <clears throat> Here's actually a picture of, of some real data from this experiment. Um, the light is emitted uh, in a ring shape for some, um, just uh, some details of how the light is emitted. And you can see the, these pixels here are the same as these, um, these bulbs, these camera bulbs, essentially. So that's actually um, a way you can image a neutrino going through the mountain detector. Um, another very famous one is called the Ice Cube Observatory. This is uh, at the South Pole. Um, this one is built, again, it's optical detectors. These are like little cameras, basically, for light. It's built a kilometer beneath the ice at the South Pole. Um, and it's a, basically a square kilometer. So it's actually like really huge in itself. And it waits for neutrinos to pass through. Um, this building on top is where all the uh, data is processed and um, reduced and sent up north. You can imagine um, how many thousands and thousands of little cameras on there um, detecting uh, particles basically constantly. It produces a huge amount of data. Um, this is a picture. Um, and <clears throat> this is a, a little video, again, of what it looks like. This is a real neutrino event. You can see the neutrino um, lighting up the different uh, cameras as it passes through. You see from red to, to green there. Um, and you can see the, yeah, the neutrino go right through the detector. That's how um, ice cube images look. And uh, actually, this observatory, ice cube, has been extremely successful um, in detecting the highest energy neutrino events so far. So these are three examples of just absolutely huge neutrino events. If you can picture, these are like, again, on a square kilometer scale. So that's the kind of this, this minuscule particle that doesn't even, I mean, doesn't even have a physical size is able to produce um, that much light. And kind of a fun fact, uh, <laughs> when Ice Cube first started um, detecting neutrinos at very high energies, they would name them after Sesame Street characters. So this is the BERT event, the Ernie event, and the Big Bird event, but now they've detected too many, so the, the system is broken down. Um, and one in particular um, was associated with a blazar, which is um, an extremely active galactic uh, nucleus, and it has like jets pointing out of it, and the jets are pointing at us. And so this one they were actually able to associate with a particular source. Um, that also produces cosmic rays. And that was like a really big deal a couple years ago. Um, but it took many, many years of 
data collection just to find one event that could be associated with a particular source. So uh, it's clear that in order to make progress in the field, we need to be able to probe higher energies, so we need a bigger detector or new techniques. And that is uh, really where um, the research that I've been working on in the last 10 or 15 years or so uh, is starting to come into play. <clears throat> and that is detecting particles based on radio emission that they emit. So before we had seen neutrinos emitting um, optical emission, but optical emission, um, the radiation like this such that it gets absorbed very quickly in um, different media. So for example, in ice, it's okay if, you're, if your neutrino interacts in the square kilometer, you can still see the event, but you're not gonna be able to see much further away from, um, from, from your detector than that because um, the, the emission will just be absorbed by the ice. Radio emission, like the same exact kind of signal you would get in a car radio, however, um, basically doesn't, um, doesn't get absorbed at all by ice. So if you look in a direction and you're looking in some kind of ice, you can basically see as far as you want um, in radio emission. So you, what that lets you do is it opens up a really wide area of detection space. So your neutrino travels through ice, interacts, produces um, this radio emission very far away, and then you can see it. So now you're talking all of a sudden about detectors of tens of um, cube kilometers and hundreds of cube kilometers rather than um, just one. <clears throat> yeah, so the, the takeaway message is radio waves travel very far in ice and that makes it a really nice um, technique to use. So um, I'm gonna talk in particular, there, this is like a very up and coming thing, so a lot of different people are trying this technique. Um, I've been involved in two um, experiments in particular that, that are trying to do this. Um, and so what I'm gonna do now is explain more details about those experiments, how they work, and also um, just kind of fun practical details about how you go about building an experiment in, well, in conditions like this, basically. <clears throat> so first, stop, um, let's go to Greenland. This is a uh, continent that has uh, a lot of ice and some important properties are that the ice is very thick that allows you to see um, very deep and it also is very cold which is just um it makes it easier to reconstruct your events when you when you have them it's also very quiet nobody lives there right <laughs> so if you go to the center of greenland you basically have um, as much space as you as you want to build your detector and try to detect neutrinos <clears throat> of course the fact that there's nothing there has its own complications um, <laughs> this is the very um, this is the very peak, the highest point of Greenland at the very uh, top of the continent where that red blob is the strongest. And it's called Summit Station. So it's technically on the summit of the continent, but um, it looks completely flat, right? Um, there's, there's no features, nothing like that. No animals, no greenery. Um, <clears throat> and so this is what it looks like. Um, you, you have a couple different things. This thing on the top, the ski way, that's where your airplane lands. Um, yeah, the, the big house here, um, that's where you, people eat their meals and that's where the one shower and the place is for everybody. There are like 30 people there usually. Um, and then that's it, people sleep in like, um, let's see. Oh yeah, here's a close up of the big house. It's actually on stilts because every year the snow accumulates a couple meters. Um, and so they basically have to raise it up every couple of years. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture of uh, an airplane landing on the runway, <laughs> which, yeah, uh, it's remarkable. And um, it has skis, of course, right? You can put wheels on that thing. And this is where um, people stay. These are actually um, huts that were used for ice fishing uh, that, that people can stay in. Um, they're not heated, and um, so it gets pretty cold. Um, when I was there last summer, two summers ago, summer 2021, um, I think the, the warmest it was was like negative five degrees Celsius. Um, and then the coldest, it got a lot colder, of course. So anyways, um, yeah, uh, you basically have, um, if you have a shampoo bottle or something, you can't store it in there because it'll freeze <laughs> and you won't be able to wash your hair. And you also have to have sleeping bags that are like rated to negative 50 degrees, things like that. But um, it's fun. So this is the detection 
technique. This is a schematic. Um, here you're looking at <clears throat> the ice surface. Um, the, the big house on stilts is over there in the corner just for um, reference. And the idea is that you drill holes down into the ice, um, 100 meters roughly, because the top part of the surface of the ice um, is very irregular. So if you have a signal traveling through that part, it gets bent around a lot. So you want to be down in the deep ice where, where you understand um, the properties. You drill holes and you put um, different antennas in the holes. And then you have a neutrino coming in, uh, interacting, and then the radio emission again will hit your antennas and you will be able to detect a neutrino. This is um, a little bit more of the plan for how this experiment is working. Um, on the left, this is a map of where all the different uh, stations will be. This blue line in the middle is the, the runway. <laughs> so it's kind of like all the way around the runway. Um, and I, I don't know if you can read it, but they're all named after different Greenlandic animals, so it's kind of fun. Um, and this is what one station looks like. It has three holes that have been drilled 100 meters deep, right? It has different types of antennas, different polarizations um, of antennas on the end of the, the strings. Um, what that lets you do is uh, it gives you a handle on, on your reconstruction, essentially. And then you also have um, some antennas at the top uh, at the surface. And what that lets you do is, um, well, you can, it gives you another way to reconstruct the event, but you also, you know, you have neutrinos coming from all underneath, but you also have cosmic rays coming from the top. Um, and the cosmic ray signal looks a lot like a neutrino signal. Um, so those basically act as a veto. <clears throat> All right, so how do you drill holes? Um, <laughs> yeah, so you have a drill and you have to be able to move it around. There's not really like, reg you know, like regular cars and things like that. So you have a, a big tractor thing that has a, uh, like a platform and you put the drill on the platform and it just pulls it from place to place essentially. Um, and then at each different site you erect the drill, that's what you can see here, and then this is actually a video of the drill goes down into the ice, um, pulls up whatever it's drilled out and then spews it out uh, here. So it's just ice chips being, being thrown out. Often somebody's like trying to dig a hole right where <laughs> Uh, that is being speed up for some different purpose. And it's cool because um, at the surface, the ice looks like you would expect, but once you get 100 meters deep, um, the ice looks, I, I don't know if you can see, there are like bubbles in it there. So you're looking back in time, essentially, as you get deeper and deeper. Um, I think in, in this particular location, 100 meters deep corresponded to like 300 years, something like that. So um, everybody collected ice chips and had them in their drinks <laughs> from 300 years ago. <clears throat> um, something that's kind of unexpected problem to have is that the drill got too hot, actually. Um, so what would happen is you pull this massive metal thing out of the, of the hole in the ice, it heats up in the sun, and then when you put it back in, it, like everything that's melted on the surface refreezes, and then the drill is stuck, and that's a huge problem. So actually what they had to do this year was build a giant tent around the drill um, to keep it cool. It's like strange problems that you don't expect. This is a picture of um, the drilling process happening uh, inside the tent. It looks like, oh, <laughs> looks like they're just filling up the tent with ice, actually. Um, <clears throat> but this is what it looks like. The ice drops out of the drill, and then you have something like a, like a wood chipper that, that uh, spreads it out on the surface. All right, so um, <clears throat> you have the holes. Now you have to put um, the equipment in the holes. And again, these are 100 meters deep, so it's like a little bit challenging. Um, what we did was um, we built this, we called it a deployment shack. Um, and you can drag it around on a snowmobile. And what it does is it, it creates like an indoor sort of environment um, to keep you like uh, warm, basically, when you're, when you're trying to make all these connections. Because when you have um, the antennas on the strings, you have all these little metal connectors that would be like really impossible to do in cold temperatures. So um, you drive this thing over the top of a hole. That's what it looks like looking down. It's pretty eerie, actually. Um, and then the deployment check has also a hole cut into it here. <clears throat> so what it allows you to do is slowly feed the antennas down um, the hole and make one connection at a time, drop it however far you need, put another antenna on. Um, and then secure it on the surface. 
And um, <clears throat> when it's done, this is what it looks like. Um, all the different flags here are marking different holes where antennas have been deployed. Um, and um, the two black things there are solar panels. And so that's how this thing actually runs um, on a day-to-day -day basis. It just collects sunlight. Now, this is useful in Greenland because the sun is up 24 hours for a lot of the year. So you get a lot of solar power. Um, in the winter, it's going to be another problem. Right now, we don't operate in the winter, but eventually the idea is to get some kind of um, um, wind power generators. The problem is anything that spins like this creates a lot of radio discharge. And so radio discharge looks a lot like a neutrino, so you have to be really careful about how you power your stations. Um, <clears throat> and inside this black box in the middle here, this is the guts. This is where all the, all the cables go into um, this box. And this, uh, this data gets sent back actually via a cell phone um, LTE network um, to the, the big house, and then you send it north. Uh, you send it south. Um, so this has been running for a year. Um, data analysis is still kind of being developed, so there haven't been neutrinos yet. But we have been able to see things like, for example, um, a snowmobile ran, ran across the top of the station, and you can identify this by the radio pulses in the antennas 100 meters deep. And then um, based on the timing between the pulses, you can point back to the direction of the snowmobile. So it's actually a really good cross check to make sure that, um, that you know that your timing calibration and everything like that between uh, your different antennas is correct. Um, <clears throat> so this is um, a plot of what we expect will come out of this experiment, actually. The idea is to run. Um, for five years or so in Greenland, and then eventually uh, this becomes part of the bigger ice cube project. Um, the way to read this plot is this is uh, flux with a multiplier on the y-axis uh, versus neutrino energy, like before, um, except for now the lines here represent um, uh, what kind of data you can expect after take, or what kind of results you can expect after taking data for a certain amount of time. So, the, the light gray bump there is prediction. Um, and then the red la dashed line, R and OG, shows you the, the upper limit of where you expect to be able to detect things. So the idea is you want to push this down. That puts you more into the expectation region. Um, and the deeper you go, the more likely you are to really uh, detect things and make, um, make an impact on the field. So the fact that R and OG is well into the um, RNOG, Radio Neutro Observ Neutrino Observatory Greenland, is well into the expectation region. So we have high hopes that um, this will produce a detection of one of these um, neutrinos that we know are there, but nobody has detected yet. OK, so that's Greenland. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Oops. Um, OK, so <clears throat> again, this was the detection. Um, this was a detection idea in Greenland. You put your antennas in the ice, and you see your neutrino uh, that way. But you can also play a couple other games. Um, some of the radio mission, for example, might escape the ice and go back up into um, the surface, into the atmosphere. So maybe you can put something up there that can detect neutrinos. Um, you also have cosmic rays. These are, the, the, again, the, the particle showers that come from cosmic rays interacting. They produce the same kind of emission, which can either bounce off the ice and go up, or if it's like a very inclined shower, it can just be seen directly. So if you put something up in the sky, um, you can see all these things. And you also have a huge detection volume. So that's the, um, the idea. Uh, behind the experiment ANITA, which stands for Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna. This is the one I worked on as a, a, a student. Um, the idea is that you have a bunch of antennas on t um, suspended from a balloon, and you fly this at something like 30 or 40 kilometers above Antarctica, and then you can look down and use the entire continent as um, your detection area. So, this is really trying to tackle the problem of one particle per square kilometer per century um, by using the entire continent. Um, <clears throat> so that's the idea. Um, that's the, this is one of the original drawings back like a, a long time ago for, for how uh, they expected it to be. And here's what it looks like in real life. 
Um, this is the, um, the instrument that is suspended. Normally it's on a balloon when it's taking data, but this is when it's on the ground um, just being prepared. Now, um, you can, when, you, when you do this kind of thing, you, you'll see pictures later, you launch the balloon and it flies for a certain amount of time, but then you only get like a, a month or so of data at a time. So there are a bunch of different iterations. This is the third um, version of Anita, I believe, and there have been four so far. Um, so each one of these uh, white boxes is an antenna with two polarizations like that. Um, and then it has solar panels on the bottom row of antennas. Um, and once the thing is launched, the, the solar panels actually drop down below the bottom rung of antennas. The reason they're not down now is because you, you would be dragging on the ground. Um, in the middle uh, is the instrument itself, like all the electronics, um, battery boxes, communication, things like that. You can see some different types of antennas in the very, very top of the instrument. Those are telemetry, so that way you can send data back in real time and you don't have to wait for this thing to land actually before you get your data. Um, okay, <clears throat> so how do you even start a project like this? Well, first you have to go to Antarctica. Um, there are actually a lot of bases in Antarctica. Uh, a lot of the neutrino stuff is happening at the South Pole, but this one is actually taking place at um, McMurdo Station, which is uh, the US base um, at the very edge of the continent here. It's the closest uh, point to, to um, New Zealand, actually. So you go there from New Zealand. This here is a photo um, looking down at the, the little city of McMurdo. So at Greenland, there were like 30, 40 people there. Here in the summertime, which is December in Antarctica, um, you're talking about like 800 to 1,000 people. So it's really like a bustling little town, actually. Um, <clears throat> Again, you go in uh, one of these military-style planes and you land on ice. Um, the runway in Antarctica is actually on top of water, which is a little scary. The, the, the runway is only two meters thick, actually. Um, and, you know, at some points in the summertime, it becomes, it gets like a little bit uh, too thin for planes to land, and then they have to make a new <laughs> airport, um, like a couple kilometers down the road. But th this, is what it, um, this is what it looks like. This um, actually, if I go back, you can see here where McMurdo is. Um, it's right on the edge of the continent, and this little part that's shaded gray that's not part of the main thing um, is an ice shelf. So this can melt, um, and then, and then um, every winter it grows the ice back again. So um, at one point in the summer, a giant ship comes and barges through and breaks up all the ice um, to bring supplies in. But at this point, it was a runway. <clears throat> um, this is what, just a couple pictures of the town, uh, McMurdo. Um, on the upper left there is like a dormitory. It's actually really not that different from being in college. You <laughs> have dormitories and a cafeteria and like a coffee shop and uh, there's like a place for um, exchanging, like if someone's leaving and they don't want to bring their boots home, they can just leave them in this place and somebody else will grab them when they, when they show up. <clears throat> and there's a little chapel there that the original explorers built. Um, there's also a lot of recreational um, activities. In Greenland, there was nowhere to go. Actually, the one thing you were allowed to do is walk back and forth on the runway, which, you know, it's a little <laughs> boring. Um, but here, they actually have hiking paths and stuff like that. So this is, um, this is a sign of uh, different hiking trails you can go on. Um, and they're marked by th these flags so you don't get lost. There are um, these uh, crevasses in the ice that you have to be careful for. And then um, some places they have these things called emergency apples. And basically if you get stuck in a storm or something like that, you can just hide in one of those. And um, there's water and food and blankets and all that. <clears throat> okay, so back to the science stuff. Um, this is what it looks like to um, build the actual experiment. This is, um, again, uh, all the different antennas have to be cabled into a central box. That's what this thing is here. These little metal boxes on the side are, are amplifiers because the signal is really weak. Um, and then this thing decides if there has been an event or not. Um, we built uh, the instrument in one of these. It's like, a, like an aircraft hangar almost. Um, and so you basically build the top, 
layer, raise it up on the crane, build the next layer, raise it up on the crane, et cetera. And then you drive it around outside to do things like, for example, make sure that the GPS system is working. Um, if you drive it far away, you can send some like test pulses and that gives you a really good calibration for, for your system. Um, one interesting thing that happened was one time um, we were outside and a penguin showed up and they, there's a like international law in Antarctica that you're not allowed to mess with the wildlife at all. So you can't, you know, <laughs> I mean, not that we would because everybody was excited to see a penguin, but you can't shoo it away. So basically it wandered around all day and we had to um, essentially lose a day of work uh, until it wandered off. Um, okay, <clears throat> so when the instrument is actually ready, you have a launch. Um, and this is uh, pretty stressful actually because um, the conditions have to be perfect essentially. So they do these things like this thing has to rise directly up into the atmosphere. So you have to make sure the wind is going in the same direction at all the different layers up to like um, a couple kilometers. And uh, the balloon itself is very um, fragile. It's made out of some material like, like um, a bag you would put vegetables in or something at the grocery. So it's like extremely fragile. And um, once you decide to go, you can't like take it all out and put it back. Like you have to go. Um, so what they do is first you lay out the balloon on, a, um, on the ice and you start to fill it. Um, then you release the balloon and you, you drive the instrument, which is on this vehicle there, in the same direction as the balloon. And then over here, you release the balloon, and the thing flies away. And then you really have no control over it for the next, um, well, however long it flies, uh, which can be um, probably like between three and five weeks, something like that. <clears throat> um, the kind of data that you get when this thing is actually flying around looks like this. So this top picture here is a schematic of um, if you have a signal reaching the antennas, the instrument, which of the antennas sees a signal um, is lit up in orange there. And then over here you have um, um, an image of what the actual signal looks like. So this is all you get is these little pulses. Um, but based on the timing difference of when the pulses arrive in the different antennas, you can reconstruct the direction that it came from. So this is a map um, in units of uh, elevation and azimuth angle, looking down at the continent, essentially. And that bright spot is the place where your signal came from. Um, this is extremely important to be able to do that um, really well, because as this thing flies around the continent, you get so much background. Um, if you fly over a base, for example, you just get bombarded. If you fly. Um, yeah, if you fly over places even where you don't know there are people, um, like starting a snowmobile, for example, releases a signal that the, that the um, instrument can see and a trigger on, and it looks like a neutrino. So you have to be able to point back and then later go back and check and make sure no one um, has been there. So um, this is what a map looks like of a flight of the balloon. So you release it in McMurdo, it flies um, in a polar vortex that's set up um, around Antarctica. This naturally happens every, um, <clears throat> every year. And so your instrument goes around in a couple of circles. Um, and then at some point, um, either it starts losing elevation or um, in, in one of the flights, it was flying too close to the edge of the continent. So um, they were worried it would go over the ocean. And if it falls over the ocean, you can't get it back. And so eventually, you have to cut it down. And um, there is a parachute on it, but it's not exactly a smooth landing. So <laughs> that's actually what it looks like um, when, it, when it hits the ground. Uh, one of the flights, the parachute, it's supposed to drop off when, after it hits the ground, but one time it didn't. So then you, know, you drag it through the, the snow, and you just it, it's a giant mess. But um, the actual instrument, where all the electronics are, is designed to be able to handle that rate. Um, and then the antennas, if they're crunched up or broken or not, it doesn't really matter. You try to remove them so you don't pollute the planet, but um, you don't actually need them. And then you take your instrument back home and you analyze the data. So, okay, yeah, um, no neutrinos, of course. Um, but what this is doing is setting lower 
and lower, better and better limits on what neutrinos you would expect to see. So again, this is a plot where you have the flux of neutrinos versus energy. The gray band is where you want to be, and each successive flight of Anita pushes deeper into that region. What we did see, though, um, are cosmic rays. So remember, there's this potential way to see the signal where you bounce your radio emission from a cosmic ray off the ice, or you have direct emission from the cosmic ray in the atmosphere. The really cool thing about that is um, if you look at this plot here, this is the, um, the radio signal as seen by Anita. The red lines are when Anita has seen a direct event. So that would be this top cosmic ray direct. The, the blue lines are when you see a signal bouncing off the ice. And you can tell because the polarity is flipped on the signal. So that is literally just the signal bouncing off the ice and going back up. So that's um, really nice, A, to show that you can detect cosmic rays. The machine, the, the, the idea actually works. It's not that um, we're just missing neutrinos because it doesn't work. It's actually working in detecting cosmic rays. And the reconstruction um, is such that you can actually see the um, pol polarity flip there. Um, OK, so what's next for this experiment? Um, the next generation of Anita that is rebranded to Pueo, which is the name of an owl in Hawaii. Um, and it's just like more antennas, more solar panels, everything bigger. Um, and it's going to fly, hopefully, in a balloon that uh, has a longer period. They have these super balloons now that can fly for months instead of weeks. Um, and so the idea is that really, hopefully, with this guy, um, they'll see the neutrino signal. So that brings me to the end. Um, <clears throat> this was just uh, an introduction of a couple of interesting experiments. And um, yeah, to see these really faint and rare particles, you have to do some uh, extreme things. So uh, with that, uh, thanks. And I'll be happy to answer any more questions anybody has. Mm -hmm.